Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Lecture 38, we uh, restart our discussion on finite element method uh, and its uh, basis functions. Mostly um, people have started on using linear basis functions. These are the least possible ordered uh, polynomials. Although it is a basically a global method, but its application wise it is uh, local because its footprint is limited. And we talk about uh, various properties of Lagrange and Hermite interpolations, of how they are different and uh, which are used here in FEM. In FEM, we actually use the Lagrange method, uh, while we have talked about Hermite interpolation method when we talked about the compact schemes. So, we have seen that. So, let us try to figure out how we can improve the accuracy of Lagrange interpolation. Uh, one of the way is uh, the HP element method. H uh, refers to the grids or the element uh, size and P is the order of the basis function uh, functions. And if we uh, migrate from linear basis function to quadratic basis function, one would expect that we would gain in some accuracy. Uh, we notice some of the properties of the basis functions for this Lagrange interpolation which are uh, translated in various coordinate system. Here we will be stating them in the local coordinate system. Then we will be transferring them into a global coordinate system, because we need to uh, work out the discrete equations that we will be eventually solving. And we pick up some examples of bobnov galakin method, which uh, basically is nothing but a weak form of this uh, governing differential equation. Uh, We are just uh, discussing about finite element method. And, uh, you know, we, we do not have adequate time to uh, go deep into the subject. Uh, this uh, itself uh, deserves probably more than one semester of treatment on this topic alone. But uh, as I promised, that uh, we'll try to connect it to other topics that we have done. Basically, uh, are on the uh, track. Uh, if we say that uh, in finite element method, what we do is we take the domain and then uh, divide it into smaller domains. So, for example, a typical subject is encapsulated between the node E and E plus 1. <coughs> then uh, we try to fit in uh, a a function between these two uh, points, 1 and 2, uh, by this uh, uh, linear uh, function here. So, what you really need to do is uh, find out uh, C 1 and C 2. At the same time, for the sake of uh, ensuring continuity of the solution across the nodes, so we uh, all uh, want uh, that these polynomials uh, in such a way that at the node E and E plus 1, there would be absolute continuity of the element. Okay. For example, uh, for the point we are seeing here, uh, the value is U 1 and X, say I call it as X A and for the node E plus 1, uh, the value of the function is U 2 and the independent variable uh, takes the uh, value of X B. So, X A and X B are uh, in a sense a, a global coordinate system, right, uh, with an origin somewhere else fixed. Huh? Now, we need to find out C 1 and C 2 and uh, that should uh, uh, give us the local uh, representation of this uh, node element. So, it is easy, you solve 20 A and 20 B and uh, you get uh, this. 
uh, equation 21, uh, where you find out that uh, local representation of the known uh, given by the functional uh, is uh, a sum of the two functions, linear functions, which we are calling as psi 1 e and uh, psi 2 e <coughs> times those uh, nodal functions. So, basically uh, keeping this uh, figure in front of us would uh, help. So, this is uh, our x a and this is our x b and uh, the function value at this point is uh, u 1 and at this point u 2. <coughs> so, what we are doing? We are writing the uh, function here uh, in terms of this, uh, two uh, values at the node. So, that uh, those are u 1 and u 2. Then uh, what happens is the linear functional will uh, give you uh, two possible uh, linear variations. So, one is uh, drawn like this and the other one is this. So, it is basically a linear combination of these two sets of functions. One that uh, decays from uh, 1 to 0. So, that uh, that function is uh, this, right? So, this is your uh, psi 1 and uh, this is our psi 2 e. Okay. So, this is the way that you write. <coughs> what you notice that uh, there are certain properties that you can ascribe to the psi functions. The psi functions are such that uh, when I am writing psi 1 e uh, evaluated at let us say x 1 or x a, uh, this is equal to 1 and psi 1 e at uh, x 2 uh, is 0 and you can uh, write down the other points, they also will be 0. Uh, in contrast, uh, you will uh, see that, uh, that psi 2 function uh, evaluated at x 2 that would be uh, equal to 1, whereas uh, psi 2 e uh, evaluated at x 1 is equal to 0. So, this basically tells you that uh, this uh, if I were to write uh, psi j e and if I write x i, uh, this is like your uh, delta function, right. When i is equal to j, it is 1 and when i is not equal to j, uh, it is 0. Although you can see in between, it is not like a delta function that it goes here 1 and then it is 0 everywhere. It is a kind of a linear function, but still uh, at the discrete nodes we can uh, do this. When actually you uh, interpolate a function uh, by the function values at the nodes, such interpolations are called Lagrange interpolation, right? Lagrange interpolation and uh, this kind of functions that we generate the psi j e, we will call them as the Lagrange polynomial. Uh, we are uh, already familiar with the Hermit polynomials or Hermit functions. Where did you use them? In your compact schemes, right? Uh, in the Hermit polynomial, what you do instead, you try to interpolate the derivatives in terms of the function. So, note the difference in uh, Lagrange interpolation, you interpolate the function in terms of the function values itself only. So, interpolate functions. In Hermite polynomial uh, fun, uh, interpolation, you interpolate the derivative. So, this, this is the essential difference between the two. And they, they are all pervading in computing. So, you, you would most of the time get uh, one of the two kinds. Okay? Of course, there are other things where we can uh, uh, do uh, a combination of the two. Okay. So, uh, what happens is, there is another property that you also notice that uh, this psi j's that we have <coughs> at any low x location that we uh, note, this plus this will always add up to 1. That you can very clearly see in for 
So, from 22, if I add this psi 1, psi 1 e plus psi 2 e, you can see this x part will cancel and you will get all is equal to 1. So, this is the essential uh, property uh, that you have for the Lagrange uh, interpolation. Okay. So, these are the uh, two essential properties that we see that number 1 is that it uh, behaves like uh, a Dirac delta and number 2 is, uh, is sum over all psi j uh, at any x, say depending on uh, whatever you have. So, this will always add up to 1. And what we are uh, seeing here is for a linear functional, but you can see that it also uh, works for any other uh, types of uh, interpolation that you can think of. <clears throat> for example, uh, uh, we uh, are going to shortly see this quadratic interpolation, uh, but before I uh, do that, uh, let me also mention that uh, instead of writing this uh, writing this interpolating functions in uh, global coordinate, we can also uh, talk about a local coordinate system. So, for each element I can uh, fix an origin. For example, here I could just simply uh, start a origin here and define a coordinate system. I will call it as say x bar and if I do that, uh, so x bar is uh, fixed uh, with the origin at the node e, then this is easy that psi 1 e in this uh, local uh, representation would be 1 minus uh, x bar by h. So, it starts off with 1 and it decays uh, uh, with that slope of minus 1 over h and the psi 2 is uh, starts off from 0 and uh, reaches the value of 1 at uh, x, equal to x bar equal to h. Right? That is what your equation 23 represents. Now, let us uh, take a look at uh, quadratic uh, approximation for u x and uh, what we uh, anticipate here that uh, such investment of extra work should give us some kind of a uh, extra accuracy, higher accuracy and uh, let us uh, see whether it does so. In fact, um, for um, many decades now, the finite element uh, practitioners uh, have coined this term called HP element method. So, this uh, has been claimed to be the uh, more accurate uh, finite element version, where H represents the size of the element, right? Like what we are talking about in this, like delta x will be equivalent to your H. And P is the uh, the order of the polynomial. So, H represents the spacing and P is the order of uh, approximating polynomial. So, with the idea that um, if you reduce H, your accuracy will increase that is what we always expect for any discrete computing that if I uh, keep on uh, uh, reducing the spacing, then I should get back to my continuum limit and I should rediscover my original differential equation. So, reduction of h leading to higher accuracy is one of the attribute of uh, discrete computing. So, there is no quarrel about it, we will all uh, readily agree with it. However, uh, to claim that uh, by increasing the order of uh, approximating polynomial will also increase the accuracy uh, is a subject of uh, uh, further uh, investigation. And uh, uh, one of the reasons that uh, I bring this subject up is basically to highlight from what we have done in this whole semester. So, how do we define accuracy? We have already exploded that myth that higher order does not always mean higher accuracy in, in the context of uh, other uh, discrete methods. Right? We have seen that what we really need to worry about 
is look at the sources of error and what uh, helps us in uh, reducing that error. So, here also we start with a discordant note, uh, I will not be sold by this claim that HP element methods are higher accurate methods compared to traditional finite element methods. So, we will uh, invest uh, some time in that. Okay? So, we will we'll take a look. So, for that purpose, uh, we will uh, look at this uh, quadratic uh, uh, representation of the elemental functions and that would require us to solve for this three constants C 1, C 2 and C 3. Uh, however, we are still uh, restricting ourselves uh, in the node, the element is still spanned by E and E plus 1, right. But, we will have to uh, fix uh, uh, three uh, unknown constants C 1, C 2, C 3. So, we will have to introduce some additional load and uh, it has to be uh, ostensibly inside, inside the domain. We will take it somewhere inside. Okay? Uh, usually, uh, it could be anywhere, it could be anywhere but we will be talking about here as the additional node to be let us say the middle of the element. Okay? So, I will call this. So, let us uh, remove this uh, linear functional business here. So, we still have those two functions which we uh, have called them as u 1, u 2 and let us say uh, this one I will now call it as in the global coordinate system, this is x 1 and this is x 3 and we have introduced an additional load uh, called x 2. Okay. And then, uh, we will have some value here, which we will call as u 2 and let us call this as u 3. Okay. So, that is what uh, you have, uh, this uh, three relations written uh, down here u 1 is evaluated at x 1, u 2 at the midpoint of the element and u 3 at the right uh, end of the element. So, once again uh, you can uh, obtain the value of uh, the three constants c 1, c 2, c 3 and uh, substitute it back and what you find that uh, the elemental representation is as given in uh, the stop equation 26, uh, that will be a sort of a, a a combination of the uh, nodal values times some space dependent functions and that space dependent function uh, would be a quadratic as we started off with. <coughs> uh, I will just uh, not uh, go through this uh, algebra which I uh, am sure you can uh, do it yourself by using Kramer's rule you can find out those 2 1 C 2 C 3 and then put it back and uh, order them neatly and you would find that these are those functions, you would get now three functions. right? Uh, for the linear uh, interpretation, we had two functions, uh, because we had two unknowns, C 1 and C 2, here we will have three such functions. So, we have psi 1, psi 2 and psi 3 and uh, they are written there uh, in terms of this uh, quadratic uh, expression uh, for each value of i 1 and 2. These coefficients, you know, this uh, x alpha i, beta i, gamma i, they are nothing but the uh, coordinates like this, x 1, x 2, x 3. Uh, they form a uh, pattern, cyclical pattern, so that you can exploit them and you would be able to do that. And there is this denominator uh, d, which is nothing but uh, the sum of this uh, x independent part, the sum of all the alpha i's would give you this. <coughs> now, uh, what um, we would like to do is, uh, as before, we would uh, switch over to a local coordinate system and uh, peg the origin at uh, x 1. So, uh, uh, the, and call that as x bar and then we are going to get three such functions. Okay? Uh, going through this exercise, you will find out that we are going to get three such functions. Uh, they look like this. Psi 1 uh, is the one that uh, starts off 
with the value 1 at x equal to x 1 or x bar equal to 0 and then the property of Lagrange interpolation right that it should be like a delta function. So, at the node concern this is going to be 1 everywhere else it should be 0 that is what you are seeing right. So, at x 1 psi 1 is 1 at x 2 and x 3 psi 1 is 0 and that is what exactly we are seeing that it uh, has a quadratic dependence, but it crosses through 0 at 2 and 3. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the same way uh, if I uh, look at the psi 2 function, this is also a quadratic function uh, which has uh, to be equal to 0 at 1 and 3 and which will be equal to 1 at uh, uh, x equal to x 2 and the same way uh, psi 3 uh, would be here that would be 0 at uh, x 1 and x 2 and at x 3 it will be 1. <coughs> so, now it is not uh, very difficult for you to understand that uh, in this x bar coordinate system, in x bar coordinate system what this is going to be? This is going to be 0 and this is going to be say h by 2 and this is going to be h. right? So, in this x bar coordinate system, these are the three nodes. Now, if you uh, go back, uh, it would be very, very easy for you to construct that uh, polynomial. For example, chi 1, uh, what do we expect? That it should be at x bar equal to 0, it should be 1 and you can very easily see the very fact that uh, this chi 1 is going to be uh, 0 at h by 2 and h gives you these two factors. So, that is very easily constructed. The first factor ensures that x bar equal to h it will be 0 and the second factor ensures that at x bar equal to h by 2 this will be 0. So, that is that is the reason that I just directly wrote down the uh, local coordinate system it is easier for you to see and uh, that should convince you that it uh, goes off there and it is a quadratic function. So, it's a, it would be something like this. that is your psi 1. Uh, the psi 2 function is uh, symmetric about h by 2, it is 0 here and it is 0 there and uh, that is ensured uh, by you can note that when x bar equal to 0 or x bar equal to h this two products are 0 right. Uh, whereas, it achieves its maximum when x bar equal to h by 2 and that is what uh, we are getting your psi 2 would be a function which will be like this. So, that is your psi 2. And the last one uh, is the psi 3 which will be uh, given here which will be equal to 1 at uh, x bar equal to h. Okay. At x bar equal to h I get here minus 1 and here I get a minus 1. So, that becomes makes it plus 1 and at x bar equal to 0 it is 0 and at x bar equal to h by 2 it is 0. So, that is what uh, will happen. Okay. So, that is that is the way uh, the function looks like and that is the way we plot it. Okay. Uh, however, uh, we need to really write uh, the equation down uh, not in this uh, local uh, representation. We need a global representation. Why? Uh, the reason are the following that uh, if I uh, keep it like this and then I try to plug this representation interpolation form into the differential uh, equation, what we are going to get is uh, everything for this node will be related to this only, only the three nodes only. Whereas, we want to uh, bring in the implicitness of the method. I mean what we want that the various uh, elements, the various subdomains should interact with each other. Right? That is why what we are going to do is for example, if I look at uh, this uh, the linear basis functions, then I said that my jth node uh, starts off from j h to j plus 1 into h. Then uh, what happens is if I would have taken 
the basis functions as this, phi j as this and phi uh, j minus 1 as this, then what will happen? If I plug them back in the differential equation, it will uh, just give you something like your explicit uh, representation of the function, but what we need is uh, something like this with the Lagrange interpolation property that uh, phi j would be equal to 1 at uh, x equal to x j and everywhere else it should be equal to 0. So, what is uh, happening here is that if I take the nodes, this is the jth node, this is j plus 1 at node. Then, what will happen is, I would have a function which would be like this. This is my psi j in a global system. Okay? This will be my psi j. So, it will be 1 when x equal to x j, everywhere else it is 0. It is only that in between these two nodes, j minus 1 to j plus 1, it linearly falls up to 0 that is the property of this. So, that is what we have shown. The global representation is given by this uh, red line, whereas the local representations were what we earlier talked about. It is something like uh, uh, encapsulated between j and j plus 1 at node itself. Uh, of course, uh, as you can see, the quadratic interpolation function, the global representation is uh, somewhat little more uh, complex, because what we have is uh, well, it is uh, not uh, written very clearly here, but you can see uh, this is the center of the node okay? and this is actually the element. The element goes from here to here okay? and this is the midpoint. Now, what happens to psi 1 and psi 2? We do not keep the psi 1 inside here, we just shift it by one element on this side and psi 3, which was here like this, this is shifted to the leftward. What we, we are trying to do is, we are trying to couple the elements in the representation, right, right. And what happens? What does it mean that despite having done that, say for example, the next element for centered around j 1 would be like this. So, what we are doing? We are actually superposing this like this with the hat function or uh, what is called as the chapeau function. So, what happens is those properties are always maintained whatever we talked about, right. Individually they are like Dirac comb and that at any x you add up all the contributions of this uh, elemental uh, interpolation function adds up to 1. So, that is satisfied. So, same thing that what we are doing over there when I look at uh, the quadratic element. You know, uh, the figure uh, has to be treated with somewhat uh, of a, uh, care. So, this is my actual one element, right? And this is the center point of that element. So, the next point uh, would be, next element would be like this, right? And th there would be another, let us uh, say there is this uh, next element which is like this. So, if I uh, superpose this, Let us say these are the. So, I have this function present there, this function also present there, but here when I am doing this, I also have this and we have a function like this. Now, the same way we are doing a functional representation like this. So, what we are doing? is basically identifying 
what constitutes psi j. So, suppose this is the jth uh, element, then this is going to be one of the element that we called it at psi 2 j and to that we add up this path. Okay. <coughs> and this part. So, this 3 constitutes uh, our psi j. Okay. So, this 3 elements constitute psi j, that is what I have shown here uh, with this uh, function on the right. At the same time, you would have uh, the interpolation functions for different nodes superposing on each other, those satisfy those basic uh, properties of the Lagrange interpolation, but they still constitute the same thing that at any x i uh, add up, I will have three component, one is a negative contribution coming from here, positive contribution coming from there and another positive contribution coming from there, you add all three, you will still get equal to one, this property two that we talked about. So, this is going to be always uh, satisfied. So, do not think that uh, we have uh, this kind of a representation uh, in isolation here, right. Uh, we will have superposing functions and when we add them up, they will still satisfy this. So, that is the jump from the local to global representation and why we do that, that is what we are saying that uh, global representation. Uh, would always set the weighted residual to 0 irrespective of the type of formulation, whether I do it uh, linear or quadratic, I should have this property satisfied, right. I could have p equal to 3, I could have p equal to 4, we could keep on uh, ratcheting up the level of the order of the polynomial. What is also important that why we give up the local representation in favor of global representation is that when I substitute this representation back into my differential equation, what will it do? If it is a PDE, time dependent PDE, it will convert it into a ODE or if it is a steady state problem, it will convert it into a linear algebraic equation, right. So, whatever we do, suppose it is a steady problem, then the corresponding linear algebraic equation that will obtain as a discrete equation. If I keep it like this, then the ith element only resides within the ith element itself, all the psi 1, psi 2, psi 3 are defined only in here. So, what will happen? It will, uh, the different elements will not communicate with each other. That is, that is what we are essentially saying that if it does so, then I will get sort of a disjointed differential, I mean difference equation, discrete equation for the elemental level. And then what will happen? Well, I mean they are all uh, independent of each other. So, the so called linear algebraic equation even if I do, they will turn out to be reducible because they are all decoupled. Okay? So, that will not work. So, to couple the system, we will have to go through this uh, global basis. Okay? Now, let us uh, Take a take an example, and this is the classic uh, bobnov galarkin finite element method. And let's say we are just simply trying to solve it. Very very simple equation. The second derivative uh, is given as f, and let's uh, also make our life simple by considering the variation of x between zero and pi, and uh, we'll, we'll see what 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 will it uh, do for us. What we are going to do is uh, that we have uh, drawn a figure like this, which we call as figure 3 a or something. There, uh, we will represent uh, the known u of x in terms of the nodal values times uh, this. So, as you can uh, see, this phi j as we have drawn here by the solid line, uh, that is 0 outside this. Uh, 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 j minus 1 and j plus 1, that is the first uh, relation tells you that everywhere else it is identically equal to 0. Only uh, within this span going from j minus 1 to j plus 1, we have uh, 
uh, two uh, segments of a discontinuous uh, function. One is uh, that increases with x, this part, this part that is your middle equation and the last one is this part that is a decaying function. Okay? So, that is what we are doing here. You can now see what is the essential idea if we do it with a linear basis functions. Okay? And uh, you can identify uh, this nodes x j minus 1 is simply nothing but j minus 1 a into h. We, uh, for the sake of understanding, I am taking the uh, all the element size as same. It will make life simpler and we will understand what is going on, uh, but it is not necessary or it is never practiced that you use uniform spacing. Okay? That is one of the strongest point of finite element and finite volume method that you can do it uh, uh, with local spacing which keeps varying from element to element, volume to volume. Okay. Now, let us observe that the linear basis functions here are not orthogonal. right? We have two functions, right? Chi one and chi two. Uh, they are not orthogonal. So that's why, uh, although in some books you will see that uh, spectral method and finite element method, especially the galactic kind, are uh, clubbed together. But uh, one of the difference is in the spectral method, the basis functions are all orthogonal to each other. Whereas here in APM, uh, we give up that uh, condition in favor of low order polynomials. Right? So, the resulting uh, uh, monomials or the polynomials that we have, they are not orthogonal to each other. And uh, why do we do it? Because the discrete equation will be simpler and only the neighboring elements will interact with each other. Right? So, if I am looking at the jth point, if I am looking at this element, you can see the, at the elemental level, the interaction will happen with this element and this element only, right? It is for linear basis function. For quadratic, it will be little more. We will we'll see that. We will see that. Now, uh, one of the problems that we are going to face, that we are trying to solve a problem which uh, requires uh, evaluation of a second derivative. Now, a question will automatically come to your mind that if my space dependence is given as a linear function, how is it going to satisfy a second derivative? Right? And this is a legitimate concern. This is where uh, the help of weak form as opposed to strong form comes into picture. How? Let us see that. What we do actually? We uh, try to uh, take, uh, see basically what we have, this is our function and that we are writing it as the nodal values times this. So, this x dependence is built in here and this is the original function, but differential equation says that it should be at least uh, be uh, having a continuous second derivative, right? That is what this uh, thing says. But whereas, this one we have taken as linear function. So, there seems to be a conflict. What we could do is, we could uh, exchange, we could exchange some of this uh, differentiability of this functions. Uh, from here to here uh, such that we are going to look at it like this. So, look, I mean substitution of this, this expression in the differential equation uh, will give us this kind of a form, right? right? And what have we done? It is a Galakian method. So, we are going to say we have the differential equation, we multiply by that with the the basis functions. The basis functions are phi's, right? So, what we are going to do is we are uh, going to uh, multiply, let us say, a lf basis function phi of l and then we integrate over the whole domain. That is the whole concept of finite element, right? That is what we are uh, doing here. 
the, the weighted residual. Uh, it is uh, not the collocation method, we are doing some kind of a, a subdomain method. So, what we are doing? We are multiplying by Lth basis function with this uh, form and then integrating over the whole domain. So, domain is defined from 0 to pi and this is how we keep it. So, the same way uh, the f is also multiplied by phi l and then we are integrating it and this is your discrete equation. So, 33 is the discrete equation of the equation that uh, we noted on top here by 30. So, what happens is as we said that phi, phi is a linear function. So, that d 2 phi j d x square does not exist, but what I, we could do is we could actually perform an integration by parts and that is what is done up here. So, if you do this, uh, you could write it like this that this is nothing but d d x of this times this. Now, what happens is this is the first part is a perfect differential, right. So, I could integrate it and I will get phi l times d phi j d x are substituted at the limit 0 and pi. What is the property of phi l? Phi l is has that this property, what we have written that it is 1 only at the node, everywhere else it is 0. So, what will happen for any arbitrary phi l, if it is not the end element, uh, this perfect differential will vanish because phi l is 0, right. That is what happens. So, this first term drops out because phi l are zeros at the integral limits other than when j equal to l. See basically what we are doing, these two are distinct right j and l. Only when uh, l will become equal to j then we will have to think about doing something, but otherwise this path will be always uh, contributing to 0. At the end of the element all the conditions should come from I mean we are not going to satisfy the differential equation at the end right at 0 and pi. So, in all the cases what you would find at uh, x equal to 0 or x equal to pi the first part will give you 0 contribution. Then uh, you have come to this, this is what is called as a weak form. See what has happened that we are not satisfying the governing differential equation, we are satisfying a integrated form of it that is what we did we multiplied by phi l and then we integrated that led to drop of uh, uh, dropping of this term and then we get this. Now, you can see that you are no more requiring the existence of the second derivative because you have hoodwinked the problem into giving you a product of two uh, first derivatives. You do not need the second derivative. You see these are the first derivatives and the first derivative are also very easy when we look at the linear basis functions. They are either 1 over h the slope or minus 1 over h that is what we have written uh, right here. Okay. So, what happens is that makes our life uh, rather simpler that going from uh, x j minus 1 uh, to x j we have a positive slope and going from x j to x j plus 1 we have a negative slope. <coughs> right. So, this is what we have. So, we could uh, just simply plug those uh, on the left hand side of 34 and then perform the integral that should make uh, life uh, rather comfortable and this is what you are going to get. The left hand side will give you only this question 36. See you realize that um, in the previous page when we are looking at this which are the L and J's which can contribute? They can contribute when all only all, uh, L is the next neighbor of J. So, that is what we said that if I am looking at this, so L is equal to J will give me the contribution from here and L is equal to J plus 1 will give me a contribution coming from this basis function right. Then this has a common intersection between j and j plus 1th element in this part. The same way j minus 1th element and jth element will have a common path here. So, that is what uh, we have written there 
that will come, well actually there should be a j uh, plus minus uh, L plus minus 1 and if you do that, if you do that L plus minus 1 and L you get this and this uh, should uh, convince you that uh, lo it looks like your second order central difference scheme, right. So, this should uh, make us uh, conclude as if finite element method spatial discretization is like second order accurate discretization, which is uh, not true, which is not true when you look at its wave properties, when you look at the complete differential equation and I would like to do that uh, tomorrow. Thank you.